Okay, it looks like we are at that time. So aloha everyone and welcome to a special presentation hosted by Maui Nui Marine Resource Council on aquaculture of native sea urchins to control invasive macroalgae. We're all very excited to see you here. I'm Darla Palmer Ellingson, your MC, and I'm also the local radio show host of the public affairs program, Island Environment 360, now he's only commercially broadcast program on environmental and related cultural issues aired on the stations of HYA Media. Tonight's presentation is part of Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's monthly Know Your Ocean Speaker Series, which is usually held on the first Wednesday of each month at 5.30 p.m. via Zoom. This monthly series is supported by the County of Maui Mayor's Office of Economic Development. And a few things to know before we get going. You'll notice your microphone is on mute please keep it on mute during the presentation to avoid distraction. But we do invite you to submit questions by using the Q&A button on the lower edge of your screen. And we'll leave time at the end of the presentation to answer your questions as well. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you our presenter, David Cohen. David holds a Bachelor of Science in General Biology from Connecticut State University. He now manages the sea urchin hatchery on Oahu for DNLR's Division of Aquatic Resources and the Research Corporation of the University of Hawaii's Pacific Cooperative Studies Unit. Boy, I hope David doesn't have to put that on his business card. <laughs> From 1985 to 1982, David worked in shellfish aquaculture and as a commercial oysterman in New England. Since moving to Hawaii, he's grown food fish and shrimp and worked with captive bred ornamental fish. In 2010, he started work with PCSU and DAR developing hatchery methods to grow native sea urchins to control non-native invasive macroalgae. Today, the hatchery continues to produce urchins in support of coral restoration. So please join me in welcoming David Cohen. Hi there, David. Hi, Darla. Thanks so much for that introduction. Um, I'm hoping you're seeing my screen now. I am. Okay, great. Um, well, I again, oh, actually, I'm, I'm seeing you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Are, are we uh, are we seeing uh, a slide that says aquaculture of native sea urchins yet? Not yet. So oh. are, are you sharing? I'm sharing. Let's see. Let's try that. There you go. It's starting to share now. Okay. Perfect. Okay. How's that? Looks great. Fantastic. So thanks again for that introduction. Um, the Sea Urchin Hatchery pro <clears throat> excuse me, project falls under the umbrella of the State Division of Aquatic Resources Aquatic Invasive Species Team. Our work site is the Anui Nui Fisheries Research Station out on Sand Island. And I'm what is called a contract employee through the Research Corporation of the University of Hawaii and the Pacific Cooperative Studies Unit. I do need an extra large business card for that. <laughs> right. um, so I'm here today to tell you about um, how we grow native sea urchins to control non-native invasive seaweeds and restore coral reefs. So first I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Division of Aquatic Resources uh, and I'll tell you about the Aquatic Invasive Species Team. I'll go on to tell you about an invasive seaweed introduction in Kaneohe Bay and our efforts to manage that through mechanical and biological means. <clears throat> I will talk a little bit about sea urchins as biocontrol, and I'll talk to you a whole lot about urchin hatchery production. So the uh, mission of the Division of Aquatic Resources is to manage, conserve, and restore the state's unique aquatic resources and ecosystems for present and future generations. And if you read a little bit further down, it says specifically that we are to fight invasive species and reduce their impacts on our native ecosystems. So in order to do that, uh, we have this aquatic invasive species program. Um, and I was speaking with one of the folks on the team, uh, our 
the head of our ballast water and hull fouling project. And she had mentioned that we are aware of over 460 non-native aquatic species. And over half of those came in with ships. So if we can prevent the introduction of non-native species, that's really the best we can do. Um, if we miss one, then we wanna respond as rapidly as possible to try and minimize the damage. And if it's too late, um, you know, if we miss one and it's too late, then we have to do our best to manage and, uh, and manage the situation and the offending organism that comes in with it. So in this case, an ounce of prevention really is worth a pound of cure. <clears throat> and that's really what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. So in the 1970s, excuse me, in the 1970s, uh, Capophycus and Ukema seaweeds were introduced into Kaneohe Bay as part of a research project. Uh, the original introduction um, in this project is very, very well documented. Um, a few years after the, the project got underway, uh, Ed Russell reported that the seaweed wouldn't spread and that in fact it didn't grow very well in Kaneohe Bay. Unfortunately, he was wrong. And a little less than 20 years later, Doctors Kule Rogers and Fenny Cox found that the seaweed had indeed spread throughout the bay. And that was confirmed later on by Eric Conklin and Jen Smith. Um, the seaweed had spread throughout the, throughout the bay all the way up to the north end. So the seaweeds that we're primarily concerned about are these two, uh, Capophycus and Ukema. They often grow together. Uh, they're harvested and sometimes farmed for carrageenan. A carrageenan is an emulsifier that is found in a variety of consumer products like ice cream, cosmetics, toothpaste. Um, while these are fine macroalgae and important sources of carrageenan, um, in Hawaii, they've become a nuisance and they've actually become invasive. So, so we wanna know what, what exactly is so terrible about the seaweed. Well, you can see here, it, it, it smothers coral. It's actually been given the nickname smothering seaweed. And once it's removed, you can see these scars. And it takes a considerable amount of time for the reef to recover. So our management goals in Kaneohe Bay are to stop the spread of the seaweed and then to restore the coral reefs. In order to do that, um, we, uh, we use this two-tier approach. First, we remove the seaweed by mechanical means um, or you know, through, uh, by, by hand or with the use of a pump or something. And um, then we add urchins to keep the seaweed down. So this mechanical pump here is called, is nicknamed the super sucker. And it's a big underwater vacuum. It's essentially a trash pump that's mounted on a barge. Uh, the business end is handled by a diver in the water and she can clear a 10 meter by 10 meter patch of reef in about 45 minutes, depending upon how thick the algae coverage is. Uh, you can see that we don't just run it around like a Hoover, but um, algae is actually carefully fed into the suction hose. Well, in uh, 2015, we had an El Nino event that spawned some really strange conditions. We experienced a statewide algae die off. and We were able to retire the super sucker. So we've done our best to capitalize on that algae decline, but we are still seeing signs of some of the invasive algae. And uh, so we keep running the urchin hatchery. So we'll try and do a real quick recap of our history here. Um, back in the, the, the late 90s, early 2000s, John Stimson from the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology was really the first person to suggest using these sea urchins as biocontrol. And he, along with uh, some folks from the University of Hawaii, the Division of Aquatic Resources, and the Nature Conservancy developed the idea of sea urchin biocontrol back in the early 2000s. The hatchery was built in 2010. We had our first successful larval run that same year. Our first urchin out planting was in 2011. At the end of 2017, all of our initial invasive algae removal goals had been met, um, but we still continue to spot treat with urchins where it's necessary. Um, as of February of this year, we hit a milestone. We released just about 600,000 urchins since the project had begun. And as of April 8th this year, 
we released 100,000 urchins just this year alone. So we've started to increase production in the hatchery. Hey, David, if you're not going to cover this later, can you tell us, um, are these all around Oahu, all of those number of urchins? I'm sorry, I missed the question. Are all of the urchins that you just mentioned, are they all around Oahu? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, the primary, uh, the urchins were primarily in Kaneohe Bay, and I'll speak a little bit about another project a little later on. Okay, thanks. Okay, sure. Um, so it takes about four, four to six months to grow an urchin, to grow a juvenile urchin. And we re release them when they're about four to six months of age, once they hit the size of 15 millimeter or about the size of a dime. So what does it take to grow a sea urchin? Um, we need clean filtered seawater, a climate controlled uh, larval culture lab. Um, we also need lots of food. Um, so what we feed to urchins are different types of plant material. Um, one of the primary food sources for the, the primary food source for the larvae is phytoplankton. And phytoplankton are tiny plant algae, right? So they're, they're plant plankton, they're microalgae that live in the water column. Um, we also feed them with benthic diatoms. Benthic diatoms are another marine plant and they live on the bottom and on, on different kinds of surfaces. We also need to grow macroalgae for them um, or limu uh, once they're big enough to eat that. But most importantly, of course, we need baby sea urchins. And we'll get to the embarrassing question of where do baby sea urchins come from? And the answer, of course, is from adult sea urchins. So as I mentioned, urchin larvae eat a lot of phytoplankton. They, they eat these little tiny plants. Um, so we have a microalgae lab, and these microalgae have been isolated from the wild, and they're grown in pure cultures um, in very high densities in our algae lab at AFRC. They're grown to millions and millions of cells of algae for every milliliter of seawater. So once we start growing our phytoplankton, we can go back out and see about making some baby urchins to feed it to. So about every six or seven weeks, we will collect adult urchins or brood stock from the wild. Um, eggs are collected in these very fancy high-tech deli cups that we use. Uh, sperm is collected dry directly from the male urchins. All of the gametes are transferred into our climate-controlled larval room and mixed for fertilization. So when we come in about 24 hours later the next day, excuse me, we will see, um, we'll see larvae swimming around in the water column. Uh, these larvae are counted and then they're stocked into our larval rearing tanks at a density of four, larvies, four larvae per milliliter or about 800,000 larvae per tank. Um, we built this insulated larval room uh, to control temperature and water quality. We keep the temperature steady at 77 degrees, which is just about perfect for a sea urchin larva. We filter our seawater to remove particulate matter, and then we filter it further with an ultraviolet light to remove any unwanted organism, microorganisms. Um, the urchin larvae are grown in these cone bottom tanks, and this is the system that we have been using for the last 10 years, more or less. So now we've spawned our urchins, We've counted the larvae and we've stocked our larval rearing tanks. We're growing phytoplankton to feed them. So over the next four weeks, the larvae have to be cared for on a daily basis so they can grow and thrive. Uh, in order to do that, we run a, a pretty tight schedule all day long. First thing in the morning, we'll take a water sample from each of our 12 larval rearing tanks. We want to see how much algae, how much microalgae, how much phytoplankton the larvae have eaten overnight. So we count the leftover algae on a hemocytometer, which is a microscope slide that has a very, very tiny, teeny, tiny grid on it. Um, we then sample the sea urchin larvae and we look at them under a microscope to see you know, how they're doing, how, you know, what, what the condition of their health is and see how big their population is. After that, we'll do a water exchange for about an hour to remove any uneaten feed or metabolites from the water column. When that's all done, We'll feed them a known quantity of phytoplankton once again 
We'll come back a few hours later, just like we did in the morning, and we'll see how much algae they ate. Uh, we top them up with feed if they need it. We tuck them in overnight, and we'll come in the next day and do this all over again for about 25 days. And that includes weekends and holidays. So as the larvae mature and develop, we start to notice signs that they're ready to settle down and stop being larvae and start to become urchins. They begin to develop adult structures like tube feet um, and like little pedicellaria. And that's when we know that it's time to move them into our settlement tanks. So while all this is happening inside of our larval room, out in the greenhouse where the nursery is, we're getting everything ready for the next stage of urchin growth. We're starting to grow biofilms. Um, the biofilms are made up of benthic diatoms. We use these clear wavy plates, they're up on the left corner of the screen uh, as substrate for the biofilms. And uh, the biofilms are composed mostly of benthic diatoms. And there are, these are a kind of single celled or chain forming algae that grow on different kinds of surfaces like these plates. The mature biofilm coated plates make an excellent habitat for newly set, settled urchins, or so we have found. So to wrap it all up, on this part of their life, once the larvae look like they're ready to turn into urchins, we move them out into the larval room and into our settlement tanks in the greenhouse. If all goes well, the larvae settle out in the next few days and we'll end up with thousands upon thousands of baby sea urchins, also called post larvae or also called spat. Um, these animals at this point are anywhere from a half a millimeter to about a millimeter in size. So three weeks later, we're ready to count these little guys. And when we do that, we call on, we call on our friends. We get as much help from our friends as we can. Um, we started doing these spat count events uh, back in 2018, and they proved to be a really fun team building exercise and community building exercise. The group photo in the lower left is from Dr. Kai Fox's small scale aquaculture class from Windward Community College. We've also had folks in from the University of Hawaii Marine Option Program, Chaminade University, by Pacific University as well. Um, unfortunately, we had to do our last SPAT count, our last community SPAT count um, on March 4th, 2020, just before you know, the, uh, the pandemic hit and the shutdowns. Um, hey David, do you mind if I ask, are they fairly stationary at this age while they're being counted? Yes. Yeah, the urchins are 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 very they they're sort of hanging out on the oh, go to the next slide. Um, so in the upper left hand corner, those are little baby sea urchins on a plate, and they've settled down and they 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 move a little bit um, at this point, but not very much. So what we can do is we stand around the tank and we can pick up a plate and look at the plate and we can see all the little baby urchins on it. Of course. Your eyes have to be really good because the urchins are about a millimeter. And so we count the plates. And when we're done counting them, we record the number and we move the plates over to uh, our grow out system at the other end of the, the facility. Mm -hmm. We had a question come in. Uh, someone was asking how you determine if they're male or female, or does it matter at this point, or is sexing done at some point later on? The only way we can sex them is we wait for them to spawn. Okay. So if you remember the slide, I can, I can go back. But if you remember the slide, there was the the slide of the female inverted on the, mm -hmm. um, on the Tupperware, <laughs> right? And uh, you know, it looked like sort of um, mango gelato or mango sorbet. So, so that's really how we tell the difference. We wait for them to spawn. Okay, thanks. Sure. So, so after this step, we move them down into our grow out tanks. And once they're in the grow out tanks and counted, um, it takes about another two and a half to four months until they're big enough to be outplanted. Now, when they get to be about five to seven millimeters or the size of, say, a pencil eraser, they're big enough to start, start eating limu. Or, or seaweed. Um, and we grow different kinds of seaweed here at, at Anui Nui Fisheries as well. Um, 
we grow a few different varieties, primarily to feed those juvenile urchins, but also to feed our brood stock. And we, we also have some restoration projects going on here. Back in the hatchery, these urchins have been counted and they're ready for outplanting. So the, the photograph on the left is actually taken underwater in one of those floating silos that you see on the right. So we'll harvest them when they're about 15 millimeters in size, the size of a dime. We stage them in these floating downweller units um, and that makes them easier to collect for outplanting. What we do on the day of outplanting is we, we collect the urchins from the silos, transfer them into these trays, and then the aquatic invasive species dive team will take the trays and swim them out to the reef um, and lovingly place them one at a time out on the reef if possible. Um, sometimes we'll, we'll place a few more than one at a time. Um, but these native collector urchins keep the invasive seaweed under control like little goats or, or little gardeners of the sea. And since 2011, uh, urchins have been placed on 25 reefs in Kaneohe Bay, treating approximately 254 acres of hatch and fringing reef. Um, so the map highlights the 22 reefs and areas currently in our outplanting rotation. Outplanting rotations. Um, urchins have also been outplanted in other um, other projects and other other areas. Uh, and of course, Kappa ficus and Uchima are not the only invasive algae to smother our reefs. This is a photograph of some, or these this is photographs of Gracilaria salicornia overgrowing live corals. Uh, the corals are uh, Parites compressa and the Montipora capitata. Now, after the success of the Kaneohe Bay projects, um, a portion of the Waikiki Marine Life Conservation District was chosen for outplanting approximately 104,000 urchins to treat 4.3 acres of algae within 18 acres of the Marine Life Conservation District area. We started outplanting in this area in November of 2019, and we've released about 96,000 to date. So we'll continue monitoring the algae levels in this area twice a year throughout the duration of the project. Uh, we'll be herding the urchins as needed to keep them um, in the most, most affected areas, that, the areas that are most affected by the invasive seaweed. Hey David, we had a question come in from Sharon. Um, do you have any um, statistics or ideas on mortality of the sea urchins at that stage when you're out planting? We don't, we're, we're the last set of numbers that we've looked at over the last few years, we're looking at about 25% survival over a few years. Mm -hmm. So compared to say, what would be a traditional stock enhancement project, those are pretty good numbers. We're pretty happy with them. Great. So, yeah, um, it, it, gets, it gets difficult to tell, even though the project's been going on for 10 years, it's still a fairly new project. So we will see. Mm -hmm. is, is part of that due to predators? Is there something that are eating those small urchins? Yeah, we think so. Um, we think they're probably they're being preyed upon by triggerfish, probably by taco, octopus. Um, and even though we asked them not to, we're pretty sure they're being preyed upon by humans as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. One of the interesting challenges that we have, which sort of goes directly to this question of, of you know, what the survival rate is, is one of the challenges of outplanting these tiny guys is that they all disappear when they're small. Um, and what they'll do is they'll, they'll disappear down into the cracks in the reef and they'll try and hide until they feel less vulnerable and they're ready to live out on the surface. One of the nice things about that is when they're really small, they can fit down into these small spaces where the hold fast is some of the invasive algae is. And so that's one of the, one of the reasons we want to use these really little guys. Um, that about does it for my talk. I um, want to thank you guys for showing up today and thank all of our partners for all of our support over the years. Um, do we have any questions? Yeah, 
we did have a question. Uh, is invasive macroalgae a problem on other islands? I believe it is. Um, I believe that you, I, I, I did not put a slide together for this, but um, the Kahakili Reserve in West Maui has been a very successful uh, project, I believe. You guys had some invasive algae problems there. And I think you dealt with it by limiting the take of herbivorous animals. Okay. So that's another way of dealing with something like this. Well, that's that's great. Um, well, thank you so much, David. That was really interesting. I think I learned something new each time I hear you speak. So very, very enjoyable. Thank you. And I, I hope everyone really enjoyed uh, David's presentation tonight about aquaculture of native sea urchins. We wish you and your team so much success in your work to grow native sea urchins and control non-native invasive macroalgae and help restore co coral reefs and, and maybe someday spread to some other islands. Who knows, right? Oh, you know what? We did have, you know what? The people are hopping in with some questions. So I'm just yeah. gonna read through this real quick. Uh, let's see. Jennifer is asking, is there a danger of too many urchins and do they ever run out of algae to eat? So that's, that's a great question. And we think about that all the time. So um, in other parts of the world, urchins are a problem, but here we have the opposite problem. We have too much seaweed um, and it's in the wrong place. We feel that if the urchins do start to get out of control, we can go out and we can collect them if need be and remove them from the reef. And then in terms of, do they run out of stuff to eat? Well, so I'm more the lab guy, I'm more the hatchery guy. So I'm always looking at the world from the point of view of the urchin. And that's a question I always ask is, is there enough invasive algae out there to feed these little guys? Mm -hmm. So what we found is if an urchin is put out, if the urchins are put out at a density of about one to two urchins per square meter, they kind of settle into a density of about one urchin per square yard or square meter. And that's about the carrying capacity for the reef. And so we find that that's kind of a happy number for them. There's enough algae for them to eat and they're not starving. Okay. Uh, so we had another question. I, I heard you call these collector urchins. And uh, is there a Hawaiian name or a scientific name that uh, for these type of urchins? Sure, the scientific name is Tripnustes gratilla, sometimes pronounced Trinustes gratilla, and the mm -hmm. Hawaiian name is Hava'e Maole. Okay, great. And Greg wants to know, how much does all this cost? Um, about three dollars $400,000 a year. Okay. Um, it, this is just kind of off the top of my head, but you know, was there other methods tried to control the macroalgae? Is this a, a, a more cost-effective method? This, I, I'm told by the folks who do a lot of restoration work that this is a very cost-effective method. Okay. Um, and in terms of uh, trying to control the invasive algae, initially what was happening was they were going out with the super sucker barge before we had an urchin hatchery. And what would happen is we'd remove the algae and it would just grow back in about six or eight months. Hmm. And so it was as somebody, you know, as the team used to say, it was like mowing the lawn. They just had to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. um, we were donating the seaweed to farmers in the same watershed. And they really liked it because they were using it for compost and for fertilizer. And they were mm -hmm. kind of upset with us when we stopped using the super sucker and, and giving them all this free compost. Right. So what the seaweed that you pulled up in the super sucker is very nutrient rich for gardening? It is, it is indeed. Okay. Uh, Riley wants to ask a question. This might be a little bit off topic, but we'll throw it out to you anyway. Um, I've noticed massive reduction in limu on Maui's North Shore and in Kihei. Um, any thoughts as to why that might be happening? I do not know. Um, okay. We have not been putting our urchins there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, it, it's hard to say. I know that again, in 2015, 
we had this statewide algae die off of both the invasives and the natives. Mm -hmm. And so we sort of redoubled our efforts to try and get the urchins out to Kaneohe in, in that area, because we knew that that's really a, a, a coral dominated ecosystem. Um, I cannot speak to what's happening up in Maui. Okay. Uh, so Michelle was asking, do urchins eat sea stars? Is there anything else in their diet? Well, okay, so different urchins eat different things. And these urchins are herbivorous. They eat plant material. So it's actually the other way around. Sea star in other parts of the world and, and here, sea stars actually eat sea urchins. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, good to know. So uh, Leonala is asking, what kind of permits are needed to do research like this in Hawaiian waters that UH are required to abide by? Is it CIA, SMA? I think it's SAP, Special Activity Permits. Okay, great. Well, I don't see any other new questions come in. I really thank everyone at the last minute for, you know, bringing those great questions in for David. Thank you so much again, David. I really appreciate it. And thank you, our great audience, for attending this Know Your Ocean Speaker Series hosted by Maui Nui Marine Resource Council, a nonprofit organization celebrating 14 years of working for clean ocean water, healthy coral reefs, and abundant abundant native fish for the islands of Maui Nui. Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's projects include ocean water quality monitoring along Maui's leeward shore, visitor education programs, the oyster bioremediation project to improve ocean water quality in Ma'alaya Bay, efforts to reduce sediment runoff from the Po'okea watershed into Ma'alaya Bay, a limu isotope study, and a new pesticide education project to encourage Maui landscapers, homeowners, and property owners to switch away from synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides that are harmful to coral reefs. This work is made possible with the support of people like you. Please donate to Maui Nui Marine Resource Council at www.mauireefs.org. And when you do, you can choose from a free thank you gift, including some really cool swag. <clears throat> Our next Know Your Ocean Speaker Series will take place on Wednesday, June 9th at 5.30 p.m. on Zoom. Our speaker is Paul Strum, founder and executive director of our nonprofit Ridge to Reefs. The talk will focus on three new wastewater management pilot projects that are coming to Kihei this summer that are low cost, low energy, carbon negative, based on green infrastructure, and can be up and running in months rather than years. Uh, this is really exciting. I just got chicken skin. <laughs> the Kihei projects will highlight potential solutions to the problem of excess R1 treated wastewater from the Kihei wastewater plant, which currently reclaims between 40 and 50% of the wastewater it treats, ranging between 1.6 and 2.0 million gallons a day. To get news about all of our upcoming events, please sign up for Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's free monthly e-newsletter, Reef and Brief, at, at MauiReefs.org. <clears throat> you can do this presentation and share it on Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's Facebook page at facebook.com slash MNMRC. And you can view all past presentations at Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's YouTube page at Maui Reefs. Please let your friends know that they can listen to the presentations like this each Sunday morning at 9 a.m. on Island Environment 360 on all HY media radio stations with, with me. Thank you so much to all the businesses and organizations that sponsor Maui Nui Marine Resource Council. And thank you again for joining us tonight for this special presentation. Have a good rest of your evening. Aloha.